My name is Carol Rosen. I'm an educator who became the first woman corporate manager of an aerospace company, Fairchild Industries. I'm a space and missile defense consultant. I've consulted to a number of companies, organizations, government departments, even the intelligence community. I uh, was a consultant to TRW uh, working on the MX missile. So I was part of that strategy which turned out to be a role model for how to sell space-based weapons to the public, the MX missile being yet another weapon system that we didn't need. And I founded the Institute for Security and Cooperation in Outer Space, a Washington DC based think tank. Um, I'm an author and have testified before the Congress, the President's Commission on Space and uh, to a number of committees of that kind of relevance. When I was a corporate manager of Fairchild Industries in 1974 through 77, I met the late Dr. Werner von Braun in early 74. At that time, von Braun was dying of cancer, but he assured me that he would live a few more years in order to tell me about the game that was being played that game being the effort to weaponize space, to control the Earth from space and space itself. Von Braun had a history of working with weapon systems and had uh, escaped from Pinamunda to come to this country and landed as Vice President of Fairchild Industries when I had met him. Von Braun's purpose in life during the last years of his life, his dying years, was to educate the public and decision makers about why space-based weapons are a dumb, dangerous, destabilizing, too costly, unnecessary, unworkable, undesirable idea, and about the alternatives that are available. And as a practically a deathbed speech, he educated me about those concepts and who the players were in this game, and gave me the responsibility, since he was dying, of continuing this effort to prevent the weaponization of outer space. He invited me to come up on the platform with him and uh, actually he's holding on to me at, in this picture. I'm trying to get off of the platform and he's holding on to this trying to make me laugh. He's telling me jokes. When Werner von Braun was dying of cancer he asked me to be his spokesperson to appear on occasions when he was too ill to speak and I did. And what he asked me to do was to educate decision makers and the public about why we shouldn't be putting weapons in space, why they're a dangerous, destabilizing, too costly, unnecessary, untestable, unworkable idea, and what the alternatives are, how we could be building a cooperative space system. What was most interesting to me was a repetitive sentence that he said to me over and over again during the approximately four years that I had the opportunity of working with him. And that was the strategy that was being used to educate the public and decision makers. And the scare tactics, the spin that was being put on in a weapon system. And that was how we identify an enemy. The enemy at first, he said, the enemy against whom we're going to build a space-based weapon system that he thought was a ridiculous idea, unnecessary and very dangerous, not to mention too costly, etc. The strategy that Werner von Braun taught me was that first the Russians are going to be considered to be the enemy. In fact, when I met him in 74, they were the enemy, the identified enemy. We were told that they had killer satellites. We were told that they were coming to get us and control us, the dirty commies, that whole story. First, the Russians were the enemy against whom we're going to build space-based weapons. Then terrorists would be identified, and that was soon to follow. We heard a lot about terrorism. Then we were going to identify third world country crazies. We now call them nations of concern. But he said that would be the third enemy against whom we would be needing to build space-based weapons. And the next enemy was asteroids. Now at this point, he kind of chuckled the first time he said it asteroids against asteroids were going to build space-based weapons. So it was funny then. And the funniest one of all was against what he called aliens, extraterrestrials. That would be the final card. And over and over and over, 
during the four years that I knew him and was giving his speeches for him, he would bring up that last card. And remember, Cal, the last card is the alien card. We're going to have to build space-based weapons against aliens. And all of it, he said, is a lie. A lie. I think I was too naive to know at that time the seriousness of the nature of the spin that was being put on the system. And now the pieces are starting to fall into place. We're building a space-based weapon system based on a premise that is a lie a spin. And Werner von Braun was trying to hint that to me back in the early 70s and right up until the moment when he died in 1977. What he told me was is that there's an accelerated effort in place. He didn't mention a timeline, but he said that it was going to be speeding up faster than anybody could possibly imagine. That the effort to put weapons in space was not only based on a lie, but would accelerate past the point of people even understanding it until it was already up there and too late. When von Braun was dying in front of me the very first day that I met him, he had tubes draining out of his side. And he was tapping on the desk telling me, you will come to Fairchild. I was a school teacher. You will come to Fairchild and you will be responsible for keeping weapons out of space. And the way he said it with the intenseness in his eyes and added that very first day, the first time I met him, that space-based weapons were a dangerous, destabilizing, too costly, unnecessary, untestable, unworkable idea. And that the last card that was being held was the extraterrestrial enemy card. The intensity with which he said that made me realize that he knew something that he was too afraid to mention. He was too afraid to talk about it. He would not tell me the details. I'm not sure that I would have absorbed them if he had told me the details or even believed him in 1974. But there was no question that that man knew and had a need to know, I found out later. There's no doubt in my mind that Werner von Braun knew about the extraterrestrial issue. The very first meeting that I had with him in 1974, when he said to me, you will be responsible for keeping weapons out of space. I'm dying of cancer, and you have to take over for me. And when he explained to me the reasons for why weapons were going to be put into space, the enemies against whom we were going to build these weapons, and that all of that was a lie, and when he mentioned the extraterrestrial card, that extraterrestrials, aliens, he called them, were going to be identified as the final enemy against whom we were going to build space-based weapons back in 74. The way he said it to me, there was no doubt, no doubt in my mind that he knew something that he was too afraid to talk about. Werner von Braun never spoke to me about any of the details that he knew or might have known or thought about related to extraterrestrials, except that extraterrestrials were one day going to be identified as an enemy against whom we are going to have to build an enormous space-based weapon system. Even though he didn't give me the details, however, the look in his eyes made it clear to me that he knew that there was something going on that was a big secret that he could not divulge. Werner von Braun actually told me that the spin was a lie that the premise for space-based weaponry, the reasons that were going to be given, the enemies that we were going to identify, were all based on a lie. I've been tracking the space-based weapons issue for about 26 years. I have debated generals, congressional representatives. I've testified before the Congress and the Senate. I've met with people in over 100 countries. And I have not been able to identify who the people are who are making this space-based weapon system happen. I see the news. I see the administrative decisions being made. I know that they're all based on lies and greed. And I have yet to be able to identify who the people are. And that's after tracking this issue for 26 years. I know that there are big secrets being kept. 
And I know it's time that the public and decision makers pay attention to the people who are now going to be disclosing the truth. And then we need to make some definite changes and build a system in space that will benefit every single p person and all the animals and the environment of this planet. The technology is there. The solutions to Earth's urgent and long-term potential problems are there. And I have a feeling that once we start studying this extraterrestrial issue, all of the questions are going to be answered that I've had for 26 years. I have concluded that it's based on a few people making a lot of money and gaining power. It's about ego. It's not about our essence and who we really are on the planet and loving each other and being at peace and cooperating, using technologies to solve problems and heal people in the planet. It isn't about that. It's about a few people who really are playing an old, dangerous, costly game for their own pocketbooks and power struggle. That's all it is. And I believe that this entire space-based weapons game is initiated right here in the United States of America. And what I hope is that with a new administration, I hope that this information that's being disclosed will allow the new administration to do what is right, which is to transform the war game into a space game so that we use the technologies that are available, not just as spin-offs of war technology, but as direct technological applications to building a cooperative space system that will benefit the entire world and that will allow us to communicate with the extraterrestrial cultures that are obviously out there. I helped to start the movement to prevent the weaponization of outer space. I founded the Institute for Security and Cooperation in Outer Space in Washington, D.C., which was a think tank with an action component. We studied this issue of who was going to benefit from building a space-based weapons program, which is merely an extension of the Earth-bound war game. Of course, the next highest frontier, the high ground, is outer space. So it's a very natural place for those who play in the war game, who benefit from it, to go into outer space with their weapons. Who would benefit from it are the people who work in that arena. That's people in the military, in industries, in universities and labs, in the intelligence community. And this is not just in the United States, it's worldwide. This is a worldwide cooperative system. Wars are cooperative, just as peace will be when it breaks out. But right now, there are a lot of people benefiting. This is what our economy has been based on in this country and spreading around the world. War and people suffer as a result. It's not fair. It never has been. People have screamed for, let's build out of swords, let's make plowshares, let's have peace and hold hands around the world, but it hasn't worked because too many people are benefiting. Um, not only are they benefiting financially, but from what my experience is, there are people who actually believe that Armageddon should happen, so we have to have these wars. Um, so it's going from the pocketbook to um, the religious right, some people who actually believe that we have to have wars for these religious reasons. And there are people who just love war. I have met warriors who love to go to war. And then there are the good people, the soldiers, who just take orders. And they have to feed their children and send them to college. So they want to keep their jobs. People in laboratories have told me they don't want to work on these technologies for war. But if they don't, they won't get a paycheck. Who's going to pay them? And what I see is that there are not only dual uses for these technologies, but there are many uses for the same technologies. And once people start to learn, as we learned about the bomb, they start to learn about what's in outer space, this place above all of our heads, this common place above all of our heads in which we can travel, we can build space hospitals, schools, hotels, laboratories, farms, Industries may sound far out, but if we don't do that, we're going to build battle stations and weapons pointed down all of our throats and into space. And apparently, we've been doing some of that already. So we have a choice now that can be made. We can all benefit 
all the people in the military industrial complex, in the intelligence community, in universities and labs, in the United States and all over the world, we can benefit. We can just transform that industry so easily with just a decision based on our highest consciousness, on our spirituality, and on the fact that we have no choice unless we all want to die, and we don't. Not yet, anyway. So now we can all benefit financially, spiritually, socially, psychologically, and it's technologically and politically feasible to transform this game now, and everybody will benefit. In 1977, I was at a meeting in Fairchild Industries in a conference room called the War Room. And in that room were a lot of charts on the walls with enemies, identified enemies, names that people had never heard of, names like Saddam Hussein and Gaddafi. But we were talking then about terrorists, the potential terrorists. No one had ever talked about this before, but this was the next stage after the Russians of, against whom we were going to build space-based weapons, these terrorists. And I stood up in this meeting and I said, excuse me, why are we talking about these potential enemies against whom we're going to build space-based weapons if in fact we know that they are not the enemy at this time. And they continued the conversation about how they were going to antagonize these enemies and that at some point there was going to be a war in the Gulf, a Gulf War. Now this is 19, 1977. This is 1977 and they were talking about creating a war in the Gulf region when there was $25 billion in the space-based weapons program that yet had not been identified. It wasn't called the Strategic Defense Initiative, at least, until 1983. This weapons system then had obviously been going on for some time that I didn't know anything about. So I stood up in this meeting in 1977 and it said, I'd like to know why we're talking about space-based weapons against these enemies. I'd like to know more about this. Would somebody tell me what this is about? Nobody answered. They went on with this meeting as though I hadn't said anything. And suddenly I heard myself stand up in the room and say, if nobody can tell me why you were pla planning a war in the Gulf when there's a certain amount of money in a budget so that you can create the next set of weapon systems that will be the beginning of the sell to the public about why we need space-based weapons. Consider this my resignation and you will hear from me again. And nobody said a word because they were planning a war in the Gulf and it happened exactly as they planned it on time. If anyone had any doubt at all about how far advanced the research and development program, the largest R&D program in recorded history is today. These books are proof. This is the National Missile Defense Deployment Environmental Impact Statement, but it comes in four huge volumes, and they're being sent all over the country, maybe even to different parts of the world to our allies. There were lists on the wall of identified enemies against whom we were going to build space-based weapons. They were also talking about the plans to create the Gulf War. And that's when the Gulf War was first being planned, back in 1977. Who was at this meeting? The room was filled with people in the revolving door game. There were people that I had seen once in a military uniform and other times in a gray suit and an industry outfit. These people play a revolving door game. They work as consultants, industry people, and or military and intelligence people. They work in the industries and they revolve themselves through these doors and right into government positions. I stood up in this meeting and asked if I was hearing correctly that when there was $25 billion expended in the space-based weapons budget, the research and development budget, that there was going to be a war in the Gulf stimulated, created, so that they could then sell the next phase of weapons to the public and the decision makers. That this war was going to be created so that they could dump the old weapons and create a whole new set of weapons. I had to resign from that position. I could no longer work in that industry. 
And in that room were the revolving door people. They were people whom I had seen in military uniforms, in their gray pinstripe business suits, the same people. I see them then getting jobs in the government. They're affiliated with the intelligence community and or universities. This is the military industrial complex and they are in revolving door jobs. In about 1990, I was sitting in my living room looking at now the money that had been spent on space-based weapons research and development programs. And I realized that it had come to that number, about $25 billion, and I said to my husband, I am now going to stop everything. I'm going to stop and sit and watch CNN television, and I'm going to wait for the war to happen. And my husband said, well, you've finally gone over the lid. You have flipped out. Friends said, you have really gone too far this time. There is not going to be a war in the Gulf. Nobody's talking about a war in the Gulf. And I said, there's going to be a war in the Gulf. I'm going to sit here and wait for the war in the Gulf. And it happened right on schedule. As part of the war game in the Gulf, of course, we were told, we the public, that the United States was successfully shooting down Russian Scud missiles. And we were rationalizing new budgets based on that success. In fact, we found out later, after the budgets were approved for the next phase of weapons, that it was a lie. We did not have the technology. We did not have successful shoot-downs the way we were told. It was all a lie, just to get money, more money, put in the budgets to make more weapons. I was one of the first people to go independently to Russia when I heard that they had killer satellites. And when I went to Russia in the early 70s, I found out they didn't have killer satellites. It was a lie. And in fact, the Russian leaders and people wanted peace. They wanted to cooperate with the United States and the people of the world. When another, time, <clears throat> another time I called Saddam Hussein when he was lighting his oil wheel, when he was lighting his oil fields on fire. And my husband was in the kitchen while I was making this phone call, and I got a call back from his first attache, with Saddam Hussein nearby, I was told, saying, are you a reporter? Are you an agent? Why do you want to know? And I said, no, I'm just a citizen who helped to start the movement to prevent the weaponization of outer space. And I have found that a lot of the stories that I've been told about weapon systems and the enemies are not true. So I wanted to find out what Saddam Hussein wants, what would satisfy him to have him stop making these oil fields go on fire and stop antagonizing people. And he said, well, nobody's ever asked him that question, what he wants. So when I hear that there's a possible threat of extraterrestrials, and I look at the history of thousands of years of possible visitations, recorded history, and when I hear now the stories of the disclosures of honest military intelligence industry people who have had experiences with UFOs, with crashes and landings, with live or dead bodies of extraterrestrial beings, people from out in the universes. And if I'm ever told that these are enemies against whom we have to build space-based weapon systems, based on my own personal experience of having worked in the military industrial complex on weapon systems and military strategy, I'm going to know it's a lie. It's a lie. And I'm not only not going to believe it, but I'm going to go out as loudly as I can and tell everyone to take a look. They have not taken us away yet. We're still here after thousands of years of visits. If in fact they're still visiting us now and people are working with ETs, live or dead, if they're taking photographs, if they're experiencing all kinds of UFO experiences, then we have to look at this as something that is not a hostile occurrence. It would be my guess, based on my own experience of having traveled to countries whom we've been told had hostile intentions against the United States, it would be my hope and my intention to do everything I could to work with people who are working to communicate with and cooperate with these extraterrestrial beings because they're clearly not hostile. We're here. That's enough proof for me. I have a vision based on the new information that I'm learning about related to extraterrestrials and the information, the technology, the techniques for communicating and sharing information that we have the potential on this planet now, 
of actually living in a state of peace based on the information, the technology, the direct applications of all of that to all the people of the world, to our environment and other animals, the plants, the uh, air, sea, and land. I think that we can have a clean and healthy environment with a happy, peaceful, dancing, musical, artistic planet with people who want to make money, they can still make money with their investments. There are enormous investment possibilities and technologies that can be developed. They're all, we're seeing tastes of it now, just in the fields of transportation, communication, healing techniques, life extension techniques. The potential is unlimited. The opportunities and benefits for careers, for jobs, the opportunities and benefits for health, of our individual selves, of whole communities, of our planet itself. The potential for education, for being able to communicate from the technological ways to maybe telepathically. The communication and education techniques as an educator so excite me. We can be sharing our lives, our cultures, respecting our differences, learning about what each other wants, and most important of all, we can be touching our own essence, the essence of our own beings, the essence of extraterrestrial beings. We can reach that state of love on this planet. What could be more exciting than that? And those people who want to be leaders can. Those people who just want to sit in the light can. There is no limit to how people can choose to live on this planet. We have a chance to do that, and I think the window is closing rapidly. I don't think we have much time in which to make that decision. We're too close in too many ways to either dying our physical bodies, to having some horrible disaster happen, to having some sort of war take place, whether it's from a high technology or an exotic weapon system, or a bacterial or viral, a biological or chemical warfare, a suitcase bomb an atomic bomb. I mean, what are we talking about when we have the capability of communicating worldwide? I see that as a vision that's a reality. There's no question that we can have that right now, but it takes a leader. And from what I hear from talking with soldiers, industry people, university people, with the people around the world, is that it has to start with the United States president, and that's whom we all have to reach. If you're international, if you're around the world, if you're in the United States of America, whether you're from any party or any belief system or any religion, the United States Commander-in-Chief, the President of the United States, is the person that needs to be reached. And we need to say that we want an ultimate, comprehensive, verifiable ban on all space-based weapons, including exotic weapons that we have yet to dream about. Werner von Braun gave me the assignment of preventing the weaponization of outer space from happening. But what he said to me over and over again was that his real concern, his greatest concern, was about psychotronic weapons. Did he discuss what those were? No. He didn't discuss what they were, but he repeated over and over to me that this was the real concern. This is what we should really be concerned about. But he would add, the public, however, won't understand that yet. So let's just call for the ban on space-based weapons. That can be understood, it can be measured, it can be done. And once you have a ban on space-based weapons, you've put a lid on the arms race. People have become aware, they've become connected consciously, and they will begin to understand that there are alternatives. But his real concern, the biggest concern he had, was about the psychotronic weapon. Those are mind-controlled weapons, mind-controlled people or technology. Very dangerous weapons. The first big speech that I gave for Werner von Braun was in July of 1974. It was soon after I had met him, just a few months after I had met him, he gave me uh, the assignment of speaking in Chicago at McCormick Hall to 18,000 people. The only other speech I had ever given was in a PTA meeting, and I had rehearsed that speech in the mirror the night before about mustard being squirted in the cafeteria by the children. I was so nervous. Now I was going to appear before 18,000 people. Nervous takes on a new meaning. 
What he said to me was, however, I'm going to send you five books in a taxi cab, take these pink index cards and take some notes and you will introduce a live satellite demonstration. The Fiji Islands, some other countries, and you will tell about this live satellite demonstration. I had no idea what he was talking about. And he said, but that's not a worry either. Don't worry, you don't have to really read all of these books because I'm going to transmit the speech to you. And I said, how are you going to transmit the speech to me? You're going into the hospital. And he said, uh, I'm going to transmit it as though you're talking on the telephone. Well, I memorized the best I could these little pink index cards and I got up on the stage. There were 18,000 people in front of me. There was a podium with my picture on it. I had to put my hand over the screen. I had no idea what I was going to say because I couldn't see the pink index cards because I was perspiring and it was dripping down my face. When suddenly I heard in my left ear Werner von Braun talking to me like he was talking on the telephone. And he transmitted the speech to me, the entire speech, for 35 minutes in my left ear. I heard myself then talking about KU band and C band, and I was just repeating what he was saying. But he was in a hospital bed on the East Coast, and I was in Chicago with nothing, no technology in my ear, standing in front of 18,000 people, listening to him transmit the speech. It was amazing. Did he ever relate to you how that was effected? No, he laughed when I asked him. He thought it was funny. I sent it with my autograph to him. I thought that was funny that I would sign my autograph to him. But he sent it back now with his and he says, to Carol Sue, this time it was my turn, Werner von Braun. When Werner von Braun transmitted into my left ear this entire speech from the East Coast of Chicago, it became very obvious to me that we humans have absolutely no idea except what we're told by people who are making money on the next levels and phases of technological developments that we are purchasing as consumers what is possible. We have barely touched the tip of the iceberg of what the mind is capable of creating. And we create all of these technologies including our own attitudes our own philosophies in life, our ways of behaving and relating to people, our choices that our minds, our egos create. That became very clear to me as I started s actually integrating the fact that he had transmitted the speech to me and it was real. And I didn't go public about that for years because I knew that people would not believe me. They would think that this was completely insane. But in fact, it happened. It was real. There seems to be some reason to discredit very viable and very reputable witnesses when they say something is unidentified. Well, you show me the in individual that can identify everything in the heavens, and I will show you the second coming.